Good morning, Living Springs. Mm, people are distracted. Let's try that again. Good morning, Living Springs. Come on in, join us as we enter into worship this morning. I'm going to ask that you all stand. We are going to enter into a, a spirit of worship today. God is good. I know we have some, some visitors here this morning. I see some new faces. I see some old faces. Good morning to our people watching online, in the car, wherever you are. Know that the Lord loves you. Know that he is grateful that you are here today. And we are happy to be worshiping with you all this morning. Amen. Your king. 
kingdom here. Jesus, you're the name we're lifting high. It's your glory, shaking up the earth and skies. Revival, we want to see your kingdom here. From the highest of highs to the depths of the sea, creations are revealing your majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring.
my soul says yes. Congregation, we think about the goodness of the Lord. We think about the many powers. We think about his lavishly ridiculous love that he bestows upon us. It's a love that never runs out. It's a love that never ends. It's a love that's unconditional. There are no strings attached. Hallelujah. When we think about who he is, church, we ought to be shouting. Oh, we ought to be so grateful because of what he has done for us. Because of who he is. Because of who he is. We bless his name today. Join with us. Let your heart lift up worship in song to the Lord. Let your heart and let your voices lift up praises to the name of our God. Our Lord is a way maker. He's a way maker. He's a healer. He's the lover of our souls. Hallelujah. Bless his name today. Yeah. 
Don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. Somebody testify right now. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Sing it. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. Never stop. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. No matter your circumstance, even when I don't feel it, Never stops, you never stop working. You never stops, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Cause even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. That is who you are. You are the way maker, the miracle worker. Just want to encourage anybody who's here even right now, who's in the midst of sickness in any way, I just want you to, to step into the Lord right now. He is the way maker and he can make a way. Those who are dealing with addiction or, or financial crisis, remind yourself. That is why we sing songs like this. We give God praise that he is the way maker, the miracle worker, the light in the midst of darkness. That no matter how dark it seems when we look, that God is the one who can break through. He is the God of breakthrough. So if you're struggling, even here in this room or worshiping at home online, just look to Jesus right now and ask him, God, come be the way maker. God, come be the way maker. Come be the miracle worker. Come be my light in the darkness. Even when I don't feel it, even when it feels like this sickness doesn't end, even when it feels like this issue doesn't, doesn't end, God, I step into who you are. You are the way maker, the miracle worker, the promise keeper. And all of your promises are yes and amen. 
So Lord Jesus, we gather here this morning and we just declare that is who you are. Yeah. That is who you are. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, oh God, are the God of breakthrough. So God, come and heal your people. Come and deliver your people. Come and set free your people to love and worship you with all their hearts, all their minds, all their souls, all that is within them. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. That is why we're here. Give you glory. Because, oh God, you are good. You are always the way maker. Always were and always will be. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen and amen. Go ahead and be seated. We want to go into another time of prayer. I want to invite Angela and Bella. Come on. We want to, as, as we've walked into this next school year, we always want to take an opportunity to pray for students, for teachers, for faculty. Somebody mentioned to me that sometimes we, we you know, will focus on just praying for teachers, but there's a lot of people that are involved with students, not just the teachers, bus drivers, janitors, right? Like um, those who are in the, the psychology field and those who are working at every level within the school. So we want to take a moment and pray for them. So if you are a teacher or faculty in any way, um, at a, at a public school, at a private school, at a home school, you are somebody who teaches kids in any way, your staff, that's right. Um, we want to invite you to go ahead and stand. We also want to invite all students, we're going to do this together, all those students who are going back to school who are, or who are in school to go ahead and stand up right where you're at. Now, everybody else, I'm going to have you just extend a hand towards these ones. I'm, I've invited Bella to pray for the staff as a student. I think that's really meaningful. I've invited my sister, Angela, who's a teacher, to pray for students. Um, and then I'm going to pray something, too. We'll see. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Bella. Why don't we pray? Let's go. Okay. Father God, I just pray for protection over these schools as these people go back to them, Lord. I pray for the faculty, Lord. I pray that you break into their hearts, Lord, and allow them to bring the Holy Spirit into their classroom without even the mention of your name, Jesus. I pray that they're allowed to walk in your spirit, Lord, that everywhere they go, that the demons tremble, that these students see that teacher and says, why is she different than the rest of them, Jesus? I pray that you place your spirit upon each school, each person inside that building, Lord. And I pray that these faculty see these students and not just students, Lord, but people to pour into and people to mentor to and people to teach, Lord. I pray that there is at least one student impacted by a teacher that is here today, Lord, and at least one student whose heart gets broken into, Lord. At the beginning of the year, they were lost and they didn't know who they were, and at the end of the year, they found themselves in Christ Jesus, Lord. And one soul is all that matters, Father. So I pray for every faculty, every teacher, every person that is there to pour into students, Lord. I pray that they remember that their part and their role in you, Father. They remember who they are in you and what they are there for, Lord. That it is not to glorify themselves or to glorify each other, Lord, but it's to glorify you. No matter the, the way that they are, the where that they are, Lord, no matter the classroom, the people, no matter who is in their classroom, who is paying attention, Lord, allow them to continue to do their mission, for they are put there for a reason, Father. I pray that you break into every single person's heart, Lord, that is here today, Lord. I pray that as they leave these doors, that they continue to carry their spirit along those hallways of those classrooms, Lord. Allow them to look at the students, look them in their eyes, and see through that discernment what is going on with that student, what spirits are attacking them, Lord, and allow them to break in. Allow them to have deliverance where you need deliverance, Lord, and just break into these classrooms, Father, more than ever before, Lord. I place protection over these faculty as they go back, and I pray for peace in their minds, peace in the students' minds, and any stress and confusion, Lord, I pray that you remove it in Jesus' name. Father God, right now I just lift up um, any student that is going into a classroom, whether it's the very first time or going into a college classroom, co going back to college, Lord. Lord, I just pray that you will stir up their spirits and give them courage to step foot into those classrooms, Lord. It could be a little scary going back. Um, especially carrying the burden from last year of just different things, whether it's depression or loneliness. Lord, I pray that you break that off of them right now, Father God. Lord, I just pray that you will give them the courage to step into that classroom and to be a child of God that represents you, Lord, and um, that they lay down their burdens at, uh, at your feet, Lord. Father, I just pray that you will help them to have the opportunities to speak about you to their friends, Lord, to give them the boldness and courage to speak to them. 
Lord, I just pray for these students and I pray that you will help them to stay focused on what is right in their life, Lord, and the positives and the things that they need to get done, Lord, but not to be stressed out about their academics this year, Lord, but just to feel like they can just take each day, day by day. Lord, I just pray that each student will feel loved and cherished as they step into these classrooms, Lord, no matter what age, Father, that they're not alone. Lord, I just pray that you'll just work in them every day, Lord. Let them wake up feeling that they are surrounded by you. Lord God, we thank you that you love this generation. And God, we ask you in Jesus' name, you would break in with revival upon this next generation. God, I pray from the old to the young, God, in our school systems, that your presence would break in. And God, that there would be a move of your spirit that would not be contained in a church, but would go into the schools, that would go into Christian schools even, God. That you would break in, Lord, with a fresh revival. Lord, I pray for every student and every teacher and every person and the staff and bus drivers and everybody else. God, encourage their hearts, be the lifter of their heads, and set their eyes on things above. And would you break in this year in a powerful way. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for you love these students. Now, God, I pray for those that know you. God, launch them like a slingshot into their peer groups to share the word of the Lord. God, to break in with love and hope and revelation in the midst of this world. So, Lord, we love you and we thank you, oh God. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. Okay, so that was just a, a good point. We want to pray for parents too. So it's okay, you don't have to stand up. We're just going to pray for parents real quick. Lord Jesus, we are asking you for every parent, God, of every student, Lord Jesus, that you would encourage them and equip them, God, with your word. God, that they would be those who, God, are not underneath the doubt and the shame of feeling like they're broken because they can't get it right, but Lord, that you would set their eyes on you and they would know who they are and you would give a grace upon grace upon grace in this season to parent to the best of their ability, but God, ultimately, that they would be strengthened and rooted in you. So God, give them grace in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right, thank you, Rich, and all those who prayed. Welcome, everybody. I am uh, Pastor Dave, and I want to welcome you to Living Springs. Um, uh, I want to, we're going to take a moment to release our kids, and so are you all comfortably seated? Now what I want you to do is comfortably stand and uh, look at somebody and welcome somebody. You can give somebody a, a, a fist pump or a high five or whatever you want to do. Let's stand, welcome somebody, and have our kids be released to Children's Church. So say hey to someone. Are you ready? One, two, three. Good morning, everyone. Welcome again to Living Springs. It is a joy to be with you. Hey, first of all, a big shout out to uh, the guests that we have with us from Trinity. Let's give them a warm Living Springs welcome. Can we do that? Welcome, you guys. It is awesome to have you with us. We are praying that you would have a great year at school, and we would be so honored if uh, you'd like to join us anytime. You are welcome here at Living Springs. So welcome, Trinity folks. 
Welcome to all the rest of you. If you're visiting today, welcome to you. Welcome to those of you who are joining us online. And it is great to be. Isn't it good to worship the Lord, saints? It is good to worship. I was reading Psalm 26 yesterday, and I love it. It says this. It says, I love the house where the Lord lives, the dwelling place where his glory resides. Isn't that awesome? I love, I love this church. I love you people. I love this place where we have encountered the glory of the living God week after week after week. And God is good. And all the time, God is good. Let's give him a, a, just a, a praise. Can we do that? Hallelujah. So it's good to be with you in the house of the Lord where his glory dwells, and I hope you encounter the presence of the living Lord today. Uh, this is uh, kickoff time, so we got all kinds of stuff going on. So hang on, hang on to your hats, hang on to your chairs. I'm, I'm going to throw a couple things at you, and then uh, we're going to hear the words. So a um, couple things. First of all, I want to let you know that this is the last Sunday that we are receiving school supplies. We want to bless underserved families in our community by providing school packets. Uh, the last day is today. You can bring it in tomorrow if you forgot, but uh, we're doing that, so make sure you remember that. Oh, take out your welcome cards. If you could take a second, there's welcome cards. You might be sitting on it. Take those out. We want to pray for you in the coming week, so let us know how we can do that. And also, so you, and you can place that in the offering baskets that are at the back table there as you leave. And uh, speaking of offering, thank you so much for your gifts that support over 30 ministries here at Living Springs, blessing our community and to the ends of the earth. So thank you for your gifts. You can do that at the end as you leave. And uh, then, hey, coming up, uh, September 12, 10 a.m. Anybody know what's going on? Fall kickoff. This is the kickoff to our ministry year, and it's a highlight around here at Living Springs. Uh, right in our big backyard, we are going to have an outdoor worship extravaganza. It is going to be a blast. Bring your blanket or a chair, you know, like a beach chair or whatever you got, and uh, we're going to worship outside. It's going to be a great service. Then we're going to come on inside, and we have a free barbecue. It is going to be delicious. And so enjoy that. Then go back outside. We have bouncy houses for kids. We got a, a um, obstacle course bouncy house. We have bags. We got a football game. I'm leading a football game. And uh, we got bingo happening inside. All kinds of great stuff for the whole family. It's going to be a blast. So don't forget about that. September 12, 10 a.m. And then um, uh, hopefully many of you or all of you or most of you got a uh, letter this week that talks about our new denominational landing spot. If you have any questions or want to talk about that, I am going to be in room 145 right after service, and I would love to answer any questions you have or talk about that. So right after service, room 145, you can talk about that. And finally, last but not least, I want to invite Suzanne and my brother Greg up here. They got some great stuff. to pass. This is super exciting, so they got some great stuff to pass along to you. All right. Good morning, Living Springs. So Greg and I are here to talk about Live Fest happening September 18th. So that's the about six days after kickoff. Live Fest is a art and music festival happening out here on the, uh, the lawn or the parking lot. And really it's a time for us to be able to connect with outside of our uh, church community, to be able to make connections with local businesses, um, local restaurants, and uh, music artists as well. And there will be some um, local artists as well as there. So it's just a fun time to enjoy ourselves and also just be with our community members. Oh, volunteer. <laughs> really well. Good morning, church. Um, also, so as she said, we're going to have different vendors out there. There will be food. We have a food truck coming. Got some different variety of vendors that will be here. So please come out. The biggest thing we need from you is to invite people. This is your church. You can go to our Facebook page. On our Facebook page, there is an Eventbrite invite there. This event is free. 
but we need to know how many people are coming, so please go in and get tickets. They are free, free of charge, but this helps us know how many people to prepare for. So on our Facebook page, on our website, on our app is all that information. At the end of service, we can use some volunteers for helping us set up and tear down a variety of different things. The listings are back there. Suzanne will be at the table directly in front of the baptismal pool. Please sign up, we could use your help. And if you are a vendor, if you have a service or a product, there is space for you to still advertise your product. There is no charge to be a vendor, so please come out, see me or Suzanne, and we can get you all set up for that. Otherwise, we look forward to seeing you spread the word. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks, gang. Again, this is a community outreach where we ho are hoping to radically bless our community. And uh, this is with our community, for our community, so it's exciting time. Uh, by the way, in your bulletins today, you got some of these nice flyers. These are not for you. I want to urge you to invite someone. I want to challenge every one of you to invite at least one human being uh, to come to uh, these events. These are going to be awesome, great opportunity for frangelism. Remember what frangelism is? Friends, relatives, associates, neighbors, great chance to reach out to them. So do that. All right, we're going to even let Pastor uh, Jason preach today. How's that? So welcome, Pastor Jason, as he brings the word. Thank you. One other. Good morning. I, I, I think that they forgot to mention we're also having a health fair at the uh, live fest. Um, so we're going to be doing um, screenings for some blood tests and, I know blood tests, um, what do you call that stuff? Blood pressure. Blood pressure and I believe they're also going to be able to do COVID testing and vac yeah, the vaccinations. Yes, COVID testing and vaccination. So lots of a great opportunity for you um, again, we, next, on the 12th, we are blessing ourselves and saying, what can we do together internally? But then that following Saturday, we're going to be saying, how can we reach our community? And that's really um, what our vision is about, is not just simply blessing ourselves, but how do we bless our community as well? So looking forward to that opportunity. All right, let's pray and let's jump in. Father God, we are grateful for the privilege that we have of studying together in your word. We're grateful, Lord God, that your word is alive and is active. Your word is not just an old, dusty, uh, crusty book, uh, but your word is real for us right now. And so, Lord, we ask that you would draw in our wandering minds and our scattering thoughts Draw us in from all of those things that may distract us, um, that may depress us, that may uh, cause us to be thinking about something else, and bring us into your presence. You are here. You are here right now. We just sang about that, but it's not just a song. It is the reality um, that you are here with us. And so, Lord, give us a mind not to ignore you, um, but to listen to your voice as you want to speak to us. You have a word for us. Give us that word. Lord God, if your word is not spoken, we ask that you would immediately take it from our minds. But Lord God, if your word is spoken, we ask that you would brand it up on our hearts, that no matter where we do, what we say, or where we look, we would see it, be reminded of it, and then, Lord God, it would transform how we live, think, do, uh, and see. Bless us, Lord God. Bless your word. Bless your people. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said... Amen. Amen. We are continuing in this um, series about uh, bodybuilding. Um, and it is not just about physical exercise, uh, even though uh, we can do that as well. But what we're talking about here is how do we build the body? How do we build the body of Christ? What does it mean um, that we are the body? Last week, yes, last week, I gave you this definition of the church. Um, we said that the church is the gathering of the followers of Christ who live collectively as the body of Christ under the direction of the mind of Christ to adopt the priorities, policies, pr principles, and practices 
of Christ in the world. That's a mouthful. But it also expresses what it means. And so last week, we talked about what it means to be the body. We just talked about the physical body and the fact that we are connected, um, that we are not just individual body parts, but we are a part of the body. And it, even though we individually, our hand has an individual space, has an individual responsibility, that hand does not operate independently from the rest of the body. I mentioned to you last week, if you went out to your car to right now or when you got ready to leave, and as you saw, uh, you saw a hand laying on the ground next to your car, you would not just simply comment on the manicure. <laughs> you wouldn't just comment on whether or not the wonder, I wonder if that person sanitized their hand. No, you would say something is wrong. Something is wrong because a hand does not find its identity separate from the body. It finds its identity when it is connected to the body, and it functions within the realm of the body. And so that is what we are. We looked at that um, last week. This week, I want to dig a little bit more into this idea of what it means to be the body of Christ. Not just the body, but there's a specific body. We are supposed to be the body of Christ. And so the thing that, the, what I want to point out to you today, what I want to address today is the fact that we are the living body of Christ. I, I've been thinking about this for several months now as I've been meeting with some young people on Sundays, and we've been digging into this idea, this concept of what does it mean to be the body of Christ? That is something that we say, but do we think about it? Do we think about what that means? We are the body. We are the embodiment of Christ. And so the scripture we want to look at today is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to be looking at verses 18 through 21 and then 27 through 31. It is not that I am prejudiced against verses 22 through 26, um, and I am not trying to hide anything from you, but Pastor Dave is going to preach about that passage next week, so I am just going to skip over it uh, for right now. Um, so again, the, the Scripture is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 18 through 21, and then verses 27 through 31. But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where He wants it. How strange a body would be if it only had one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. All of you together are Christ's body. Each of you is a part of it. Here are some of the parts that God has appointed for the church. First are the apostles, and the second are the prophets. Third are the teachers, and then those who do miracles, and those who have a gift of healing, those who can help others, those who have the gift of leadership, those who can speak in unknown languages. All are, all, are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we all have the power to do miracles? Do we all have the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak in unknown tongues? Do we all have the ability to interpret unknown languages? Of course not. Of course not. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. And so as we look at this, what I want to talk to you about this today is this idea of what does it mean to be the body of Christ? So what does it mean to be the body of Christ? Three things that I want to share with you. The first thing is this is that God is our mind. <laughs> God is our mind. So, again, verse 18 says this, but we have, but, but our bodies have many parts, but who decides where those parts go? You know what came to my mind when I read this passage of Scripture? You remember Mr. Potato Head? <laughs> I, I started to put up a picture of Mr. Potato Head because I thought about Mr. Potato Head 
You have the desire to move the parts anywhere you want to. And if you were sick like me, you loved moving the mouth where the ears were, and you had all these different parts. But in a sense, the body of Christ is like Mr. Potato Head, but God is the one who decides where the body parts go. In other words, he is the head. I could have just as easily said God is our head, but I said God is our mind because I wanted to be a part of my alliteration so you would remember it, okay? But God is our mind. Now what, what, let's, let's look at that. What does that mean? It simply means that as followers of Christ, we are to live in submission to the head of the body. What happens, what would you call, do you know who Stephen Hawking is? Stephen Hawking was, I should say. He had a disease called ALS. And as a result of that, Stephen Hawking was a genius. His brain was in perfect order, but his body did not listen to his brain. As a result of that, he had this disease they called ALS. You know what I, I get afraid of sometimes? I look and I wonder, as a church, do we have ALS? Do we have a perfect mind? Do we have a beautiful mind, a mind that is brilliant, a mind that is wise, a, wise, a mind that is smart, a mind that is perfectly intact, but a body that refuses to listen to it? God says to us, I am your mind. I am the one who determines where everything goes. I am the one who determines what's right and wrong. I am the one who determines how you are supposed to live. And therefore, if you are going to be a part of my body, if you are going to call yourself a follower of Christ, how do you call yourself a follower of Christ when you refuse to listen to the mind? Sharon? Where's Sharon? I need somebody to say amen. I said, okay, I don't see Sharon. Oh, there, oh, there you are over there. Okay, you can take off that mask so I can hear you. All right. So listen, what I'm saying to you is that think about yourself. Who are you listening to? Or should I say, to whom are you listening? Okay, I know I'm in education mode right now. I don't want to dangle no participles or prepositions or nothing. <laughs> to whom are you listening when I thought about this, I thought of the passage in 1 Samuel chapter 8. And in 1 Samuel chapter 8, I'm not going to put it all up on the screen, uh, so if you have your Bibles, um, you can turn to it or your phones or whatever. But in 1 Samuel chapter 8, um, this is what the people said, you know, God was the king of Israel. God was the king. And this is what the people said to Samuel. He says, as Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons to be judges over Israel. Joel and Abijah, his oldest sons, held court in Beersheba, but they were not like their father. For they were greedy for money, and they accepted bribes and perverted justice. Finally, all of the elders of Israel met at Ramah to discuss the matter with Samuel. Look, they told him, you are now old and your sons are not like you. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. So Samuel was displeased with their request, and he went to the Lord for guidance. He, and God said to him, do everything they say to you, the Lord replied, for it is me they are rejecting, not you. They don't want me to be their king any longer. Ever since I brought them from Egypt, they have continually abandoned me, and followed other gods, now they are giving you the same treatment. Do as they ask, but solemnly, solemn, solemnly warn them about a way that the king will reign over them. In verses 10 through 18, he gave them very specific warnings. He says, let me tell you what's going to happen. Your taxes are going to get increased. And your kids are going to go to war, and they're going to be drafted, and they're going to abuse you, and they're going to overwork you, and they're going to do all of these things to you. It is not going to be pretty. He warned them what would happen if the people rejected the kingship, rejected the mind of God, and said, no, we want somebody else to reign over us. He warned them. Verse 19. 
But the people refused to listen to Samuel's warning. Even so, we still, even so that we're going to be taxed, beaten, jailed, war, go to war, our kids are going to be killed, our flocks are going to be taken in spite of all of that. He says, even so, we still want a king. We want to be like the nations around us. Our king will judge us and lead us into battle. He sure will. So Samuel repeated to the Lord what the people had said, and the Lord replied, do as they say and give them a king. And Samuel agreed, and the people went home, and they were all happy until right after the election. (laughs) (laughs) Then they went, dang it, we should have listened. Folks, who are you listening to? Who's your king? Who's your head? Who's your mind? See, are, are, you, are, you, are you mad because God is saying, I want you to live a particular way, but the way that God says, I want you to live, makes you different than your neighbors, makes you different than your classmates, makes you different than your coworkers. They making fun of me. They, they looking at me and they saying, why you act like that? Why don't you be like us? And so often, you all, we get ourselves in trouble because we are looking to be like everybody else. When God says everybody else, the way that that, that everybody else is going is leading to death. He says, but the way, my narrow way is leading to life. You say, I get that, but God, it sure is easier to go with the crowd. Let me tell you something. Even a dead fish can go with the flow. (laughs) A dead fish can go with the flow. You don't have to be strong to go with the flow. You just need to be in the water. But you know what? We need some salmon that is willing to swim upstream against the current. Yeah, you might get bit every now and then, but you know what? Life is found when we go against the current because life is found when God says, my way is life. My way is freedom. My way is power. In my life, in my presence is the fullness of joy. And at my right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Is there a price for going against the flow? Yes, it is. But is there a price for going with the flow? It's even greater. It's even bigger. God is our mind, you all. We are the body of Christ. We don't get to say I'm a follower of Christ and tell him to stick it in his ear. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. And so I want to challenge you to stop and think about who is your mind? What are you following? Now, when I said this to these young people that I've been meeting with, one of them says, but but how do you know? What is the mind of Christ? What is the mind of God? How do you know it? So y'all ready? Pop quiz time. Y'all ready for a quiz? It's school, right? So let me get you, let me get you in the habit. We're going to do a pop quiz. Here's the pop quiz. How do you determine the mind of God? A, is it, do you determine the mind of God by looking at the rules and the regulations of the church? Do you follow the mind of God by, do you determine the mind of God by looking at the traditions of the church? Okay. Do you find the mind of God by reading the Bible? Yes? Okay, you got anybody for A? Come on, just go ahead and embarrass yourself. Just go ahead, just put your hand up. (laughs) Okay. Anybody for B? What about C? Okay. All right, so let's say we find the mind of God by reading the Bible. Okay, Dave, I need you to protect me on this one, all right? All right, Dave got my back. You notice he ain't moved. He just said, yeah, Mm -hmm." (laughs) but he's still staying back there. So, if we find the mind of God by reading the Bible, how do you explain the same book being used to promote slavery and to promote abolition? I 
come on now, somebody, somebody help me out here. How, how do you explain that? How, how do you explain the divisions that we have in the church over the Bible if we find the Bible, in the Bible, the mind of God? Y'all are really uncomfortable right now, aren't you? You, you waiting for an answer? And no, it ain't you know, no, you can't change your answer now. Ain't no changing answers. Ain't no eraser on your pencils. <laughs> okay? So here's the question. Don't you find that interesting? Because people can read the Bible and come up with all kind of different stuff. So can you find the mind of God purely by reading your Bible? You can't, not purely. What about D? See, the answer probably is E, is because of C and D. Because this, when you go to Scripture and you read Scripture and you come to some conclusion, you come to some understanding, this is what I believe is the mind of God on this topic. Now you must run it through another filter. <laughs> and the second... I won't do it, Jason. I was getting ready to do it. I ain't going to do it. All right, Jason. I'll, yeah, I am going to do it because I can't help it. She just brings this out of me. She said to me one day, I said, we was talking about boyfriends. I said, you need a daddy filter because your filter only keeps out short and ugly. <laughs> I said, daddy filters keep out all of the other stuff. You need a secondary filter. So you need a secondary filter as you're reading your Bible because you can read your Bible and come to just about any conclusion that you want to. You can justify anything you want to. I had a young friend of mine who wanted to smoke weed, and he came to me with Bible and verse as to why he could smoke weed. We had people... We can have, you know, wait a minute, I want to have multiple wives. Well, David had a whole bunch of wives, and God said he was a man after his own heart. I just want to be after God's heart. <laughs> Me and David just, hey. You see, you can't just read the Bible and expect to find the, man, find the, heart, the mind of God. You have to put a secondary filter. And the secondary filter is the person of Christ. So therefore, when I look at the person of Christ and I say, wait a minute, I believe that I should be able to take people and to enslave them and make them my property in order to make me money. And I can show you the chapter and verse that shows that. Okay. Now, let's put the secondary filter on it. Would Jesus do that? <laughs> so if Jesus wouldn't do it, then how in the world can you say it's the mind of God? Do y'all follow me? Just say amen, even if you don't believe me. Just lie, okay? Just lie. Even if you don't believe me, just lie. You see, this leads me to the second characteristic of what it means to be a part of the body of Christ. And that is this, is that Christ is our model. <laughs> Notice what he says here. He says, all together... All together, we are Christ's body. Together, collectively, we are Christ's body. There's a fancy word that we like to use in church called incarnational. That's not, that's not milk, okay? Incar and it's not a flower. Incarnational simply means this. Christ came to earth in a human body, to show us what God was like. That's all incarnational means. Christ was embodied. Christ came into the and Christ came in a body to live out to demonstrate the heart and mind of God. Does that make sense? That's what all incarnational means. Christ came in a body, not just spirit but he came in a body. So let's look at some scriptures real quick. I want to show you four scriptures that talk about, that say something about this. John chapter 1, verse 14 says, So the Word became, the Word, God said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, right? 
all things came into being by the Word of God. Well, who was that Word? That Word was Christ. And he said, and so the Word became human. The Word became a body. And he lived among us as an infant child, as a teenage boy, as a grown man. He went through all of those stages and became a body. He lived on earth the way just like we did. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, says that in the times past, God spoke. He spoke in various ways. He spoke through burning bushes and through um, uh, donkeys that talked. And he spoke through uh, whales, a big fish that sucked down human beings. And he did all kind of stuff. He says, but in these last days, he says, I have spoken to you through my son. Because it's kind of hard to come and to, to make a personal application about being sucked down by a big fish. Any of y'all been sucked down by a big fish lately? So you say, I can't relate to that. I can't relate to the burning bush. But you can relate to a human being who lived in such a way that shows you how to live. So Jesus said, God says, I, in those times past, I spoke to you in all of those ways, but now I spoke to you through my son. And look what he says here. The son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. Christ is our model. Christ is our model. 1 Corinthians 15, 47. Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth, while Christ, the second man, came from heaven. Jesus is called the second Adam. He's the second Adam because the first Adam blew it. <laughs> and so God says, here's the reset button. Let's do it again and let me send. I will come and I will personally demonstrate how to live as a man, how to live as a human, not just as a man, but as a human who lives under the who lives in submission to the heart of God and lives by the power of the Spirit of God. Jesus embodied everything about the Trinity right there, and he's shown us how to live every day. I've been working on a Bible study for my men's group, and it's like looking at Jesus as a man. Let's take out the divinity part. Let's just look at Jesus. How did he deal with women? How did he deal with his mother? How did he deal with pain? How did he deal with suffering? How did he deal with opposition? How did he deal with anger? How did he deal with poverty? How did he deal with homelessness? How did Jesus deal with these things as a man? And we see how he dealt with them as a man, and we understand that what he was doing was not operating through his divinity, he was operating through his humanity under the power of the Holy Spirit. Which tells us that whatever Jesus did, we have the capacity to do it. So we can make all of the excuses we want. I can't. The Lord knows I'm human. He says, I guess right. God does know you human. That's why he sent the Holy Spirit. So that you can be superhuman. <laughs> Are y'all hearing me? You see, the Scripture tells us that God, Jesus, does this. How does Jesus live under the mind of God? He says this. He only does those things that he sees the Father doing. When Jesus is determining, who, how shall I live? Should I pay my taxes? Who should be my man? Who should be my woman? <laughs> how should I live? Should I cheat? Should I not? Should I stay? Should I go? What God says, Jesus says, he does not simply look and says, what do I want to do? The scripture says, Jesus says, what would the Father do? <laughs> I only do those things that I see the Father doing. This is what it means to live as a follower of Christ under the direction of the mind of Christ, we are looking to God and say, God, 
Order my steps in your word, dear Lord. Lead me, guide me every day. Send your anointing, Father, I pray. Order my steps in your word. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He says, and even when your steps are ordered by God, when you are seeking God every day, he says, even, he ho- even when you stumble, you won't fall on your face because the Lord is the one who holds your hand. I remember, think about it when you had a little kid, and you think about, and you're walking along with them, and they stumble, they learn how to walk. Do you just let them fall on your face and go, boy, what's wrong with you? Pick up your feet. Two years old or don't know how to walk yet. What's wrong with you? No, when they stumble, what do you do? They stumble, you lift them up and let them get their feet back under them and you put them back. That's what God is saying he does to you. If you will put your hand in his hand, <laughs> if you will listen, if you will walk at his pace in and following his path for your life, But you got to be committed to saying, I will follow the mind of God because I am a follower of Christ. And I don't want to have spiritual ALS. You see, he says here, Jesus Jesus even struggled with this as a man. Said, Daddy, this idea that you have, this plan that you have for me to save the world requires that I die. It's not just that I die. See, if it was just dying, you know, now I lay me down to sleep, and Lord, I just don't want to wake up. That's cool. That, that, that's good. I, I'm good with that. I, I'm good with just laying down one day and waking up in heaven. I'm good with that. It's the transportation part to heaven that bothers me. It's the portal through which I get to heaven that bothers me sometimes. The idea of suffering, the idea of pain. You, you, you know, and, and all of those things, I don't want to die certain deaths. There are cer- certain deaths, okay, but there are certain deaths I just don't want to think about. And Jesus said, Dad, I'm good with your plan, but this, this, this cross thing, <laughs> come on, man. <laughs> and you got something better than that? But then he said, but not my will but thine be done. Do you say that? And do you mean it? And do you mean it because you have completely submitted to the mind of God and whatever God says is okay with you? Because God is always right and God is always righteous and God is always just. See, you will not submit to the mind of God if you do not have full confidence in the heart. Oh, Let me say that again. You would not submit to the mind of God if you do not have full confidence in the heart of God. If you do not believe that God loves you and that he cares for you and has your best interest at heart all the time, you will stand there and you will argue with God. You will debate with God and you will say, God, I think my mind on this particular position is better than yours. You lose the debate, right, and you lose the war. You see, God says, I need you to trust me. And see, and so therefore, come back, come back, thank you. All right, if we are to operate as the body of Christ, then we must go where Christ would go. We must do what Christ would do. We must say what Christ would say. We must live how Christ would live. We must love how Christ would love. How would Christ respond to that? A young person who doesn't even go to church, when I ask this question, what does it mean to follow the mind of Christ, she doesn't even go to church. And she said, doesn't it just mean what would Jesus do? I was like, wow, it's that simple, isn't it? We read the book, we got the bracelet, got the (laughs) T-shirt. But do you follow the plan? See, what would Jesus do? doesn't matter what school you go to. No matter what church you go to, no matter what Christian school or Christian college, or doesn't matter. That stuff that doesn't change anything. What matters is whether or not your heart has been submitted to God to say that I will follow the mind of God regardless of the cost to my body. 
And I do that because I trust the heart of God. This ain't kindergarten Christianity I'm talking about here, y'all. Alan Hirsch tweeted this the other day. I love this quote. He says, the church that does not look, act, think, sound like Jesus is probably not the church. (laughs) Christ is the only legitimate measure of an authentic church. If we ain't looking like Jesus, talking like Jesus, sounding like Jesus, acting like Jesus, we might not be followers of Jesus. Sharon, help me. Thank you, honey. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Last thing is this. God is our mind. Christ is our model. Our gifts are our mandate. (laughs) Our gifts are our mandate. Look at verses 28 through 31. He says, all of us together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. Here are some of the parts that God has appointed for the church. There are apostles and prophets and teachers and miracles and gifts of healing and helps to others. He says that some people have the gift of leadership and some people have speak an unknown tongue. I love this quote. Any of you all watch Call the Midwives? The Call the Midwife on Netflix? Okay, three of you? Okay, hallelujah. All right. So, um, well, it's four of us because me and my wife watch it too. It's one of my favorite shows. But there is, a, there is this nun on this show, um, and I love this quote. She says, very often the hands of the Almighty are so often found. The hands of the Almighty are so often found at the ends of our arms. You want to know what God wants to do? He says, That's what, what are you doing? God's hands, you are God's hands. You are God's eyes. You are God's feet. You are God's heart. You are those things. And so, therefore, God says, I don't have the capacity to do if you ain't doing. (laughs) I have embodied you, and you have been, you are supposed to be my body. I tell you what to do, and then you do it. So, what is our mandate? God says, I have given you gifts to tell you how you are supposed to be operating individually in the body in order to fulfill the collective mandate of being the body of Christ. He says, there, it looks, look, this is what it says in 1 Corinthians 4, 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, and, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is has been given to each of us so that we can help one another. Remember what I said last week? Part of being the body, we have been put in the body because we need one another and we need to serve one another. To one person, the Spirit is given the ability to give some wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same Spirit gives faith to another. And to someone else, he gives this, uh, the Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives to one person the power to perform miracles and another prophecy, and he gives to someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or is from another spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown tongues, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being told. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all of these gifts. He alone decides what each person should have. Here's the reality, y'all. You've been given a gift. Each of us has a spiritual gift because it is was endowed upon you the moment you accepted Christ. Many years ago, my, my, my pastor and my mentor called me into the office, and he says, Jason, what gifts has God given you to change the world? When he asked that question, I immediately, it, 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 it registered some, something in my mind. And I knew exactly what my gift was. He says, Jason, I I said, he has given me the ability to teach. He has given me the ability to take difficult concepts, big concepts, and to bring them down to the lowest shelf that anybody can get to it. He says, says, that's exactly right. You need to develop that gift. God, I love to sing, but God does not call me to lead worship. I love children, but I am not working in the children's ministry. I don't love them that much. 
I love them. I like headlights, taillights. See them coming, see them going, but I ain't working. Right? You see, there are certain things that I like to do, but there is something that I have been called to do. And when I operate in my gifting, that is my mandate that God says, I have called you to be a hand. Don't try to be the eye. What has God called you to do? Who has God called you to be? Your mandate is found in your gifting. God says, what gifts have I given you to serve the body? You have a gift to serve the body. You have the capacity to serve the body. And you have the responsibility to serve the body. When you refuse to bring your gift to the body, the body is disabled. When you don't bring your gift to the body, we limping along. Because, matter of fact, we ain't even limping. We got, we got one leg. We hopping. We blind. Because you are not bringing your gift. You say, when Pastor David's going to talk next week about the fact that there are some gifts that are big and, that are, and there are other gifts that nobody seems to pay attention to. A good friend of mine said this to me years ago. I was teaching on spiritual gifts. We were doing spiritual gifts. Uh, we're doing the inventory to find out what her gift was. And the room was quiet. And they, she did the inventory, and she went through it, and then she, and she hollered out, I don't want this gift. <laughs> her gift was the gift of helps. She said, I want to preach. I want to be up front. I want a gift where everybody sees me. I don't want no gift where can't nobody see me. I don't know anybody who had a better gift of helps and operating a gift of helps than this woman. See, there are some gifts that some of you are saying, I don't want this gift. I want a big gift. But I tell you what, take the most expensive car you can think of. Get in a Rolls Royce Maybach, $250,000 car, and take out the spark plug. <laughs> tell me how far you're going. <laughs> Cut the distributor cap wire. Tell me how far you're going. You see... Everybody has a gift. And when you don't use your gift, you disable the body. We need you. We need each other. I need you. You need me. We're all a part of God's family. <laughs> Why don't you stand? I want to challenge you to find, to look to the Lord. There are some very practical ways. You can, if you don't know what your gift is, call into the office. We can give you, we have an inventory that we can give you that can help you determine exactly what your spiritual gift is. That somebody that can talk with you, let you know what your gift is. But some of you know what your gifts are. You just decided you ain't going to use them. And if you decide you're not going to use them, you're hurting me hurt me. The body needs you. I need you. God needs you to do what God has called you to do. Operate in your gifting. That the body may be the body in the world, in the community that we're supposed to be. Father God, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful that your word challenges us and teaches us. I pray for those who stand in my presence physically, and I pray for those who listen, who may be sitting in their living rooms or driving in their cars or listening to this maybe many years after it was sent, after it was delivered. But I pray, Father God, that whoever hears it, I pray, Lord God, that they would not simply listen to it, ignore it, grunt, and say, that was good, that was interesting. But they would say, yes, Lord, what do you want me to do? I pray, Lord God, that you would help each of us, Father God, to operate in the strength, in the anointing, and the power that you have given us to operate. Help us not to be looking at somebody else's gift and wanting it, 
but help us, Lord God, to be walking in the power and the authority of the gifting that you have placed in us because we need each other. If you are here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you are here today and you don't know, you don't even know what I'm talking about because you have drifted far away from the Lord. But if you are here today and the Spirit of God has moved upon your heart to say in you, you don't even know all that it means, but you know God is calling you, answer the phone today. Answer and respond to him and talk with someone and let them know, I want to know what it means to have a relationship with God, not how to join the church. I want to know how, what it means to have a relationship with Christ. I'm going to ask that the prayer ministers would come forward. Uh, if you have just a need, if you have something that you want to be prayed for or something you want us to pray with you about, we have people here at the front. Uh, if you want to uh, ask that you would wear a mask or uh, have a uh, uh, shield, if you're comfortable with that. But we ask that you would just simply come forward. Let someone pray with you. Whatever's on your heart, whatever's on your mind. Again, I challenge you. Get before the Lord. Say, Father, how am I using my gift? What is it that you want me to do? How do you want me to serve? Father, we love you and we thank you. We thank you today, Father God, that your spirit is moving within our hearts. Continue to reconnect us as the body of Christ. Lord God, forgive us for our disobedience. Shape our minds and reshape our thoughts and our attention so that we are living in obedience to you. God, you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or even think. And it's according to the, that power that is at work within us, that same power that raised Christ from the dead is available to each of you. Walk in his power. Stay on his path. Fulfill his purpose. Be strengthened, with, filled with his spirit and strengthened by his power. Go forth and pursue passionately that purpose of being known by God, of knowing God, and of making him known. It's in the strong and matchless name of Jesus. All God's people said, amen. I want to remind you, please stop at the table. Sign up if you can help us with the uh, best we need your help. Go in this grace. Go in this peace. Because of who you are, I give you praise.
Lord, I worship you because of who you 